Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all in Jesus' name to our service this morning. Glad you're here in person to worship the Lord in Salem. And also we welcome those that are joining us online uh, as well. It's a blessing to be here to worship the Lord together. We used to have an Alaska Sunday night service. We had a really good uh, married couple that provided our music. The wife played the, the, the uh, piano and her husband played the accordion. On Sunday evenings, you know, it'd be a long day, and Sunday evening they'd be playing a prelude and beautiful music. And I often said, you know, I think we should just not have the service, just let's sit here and listen to the music for an hour. I think that would have been really good for everybody. I felt that way when we played the prelude, at least so we could just sit and meditate for an hour. It'd be a, a great blessing, wouldn't it? Thank you for that good, good prelude. A couple of announcements as we uh, begin our service. Uh, first of all, in the last couple of weeks, there's been an announcement about the cantata practice, and that starts this evening up at the Methodist Church in Axville, and uh, practice each Sunday evening at 7, and the presentation will be in December 10th uh, there at the Methodist Church as well. So make note of that, and we'll come and sing. It uh, starts tonight. Also, uh, Wednesday night Bible study, continuing on in the book of Ephesians. You're all invited and encouraged to come and be a part of that time of fellowship and singing and prayer and time in the Word as well. We invite you to come and be a part of that. Any other announcements? be made today? If not, let's stand and we'll sing together our call to worship. The Lord is in His holy temple.
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be first lesson is from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life, because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not my ways that are not just? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Our second reading is from Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy of being by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. We join the church around the world and throughout the ages in professing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please join me in unison in professing, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. to go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Are there any prayer requests that anybody wants to mention that we can pray especially for, or maybe have a praise to share this morning as well? Yeah, I, I ask to pray for the whole family, for the secondary for me, not just that was in an ATV accident a week ago, uh, and the children's mercy should be coming home hopefully this week. And the whole family, the whole family, yes. We pray for them. Any others this morning? Harvest is well underway. I'm glad for a good harvest and good weather. And I pray for continued safety and blessing. We're involved in that. Shirley's birthday tomorrow. Thank you for you, Shirley. I'm not going to sing more of theirs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, it is a great blessing for us to bow before you, to come to your throne. Thank mindful this morning of that verse in Scripture that says that we can boldly come to the throne of grace to find mercy to help us in time of need. We're thankful today that your throne, O oh God, is a throne of grace that we can boldly and confidently come to and pour our hearts out to you. We pray, uh, first of all, with, with thanks and praise. For the God that you are, our creator, great and mighty God, great in love and great in mercy. And you have shown your love and your mercy and your grace in sending Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, to die in our place, to die for our sins on the cross. And so we rejoice in the forgiveness of sins and the hope of heaven and a home in heaven, and the hope of the resurrection. We give you all the praise and glory for what you have done through Jesus Christ. We thank you that the good news, that's good news of Jesus, is being proclaimed around the world, and we pray that you would continue to build your church, and that you would bless all your servants who are proclaiming the, the, the word of God and the gospel of Christ in word and in deed all around the world. Bless them, and uh, use, use them, Father, to share the love of Jesus with people, minister to people, and be a shining light in a, in a dark world. We also pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith today, that you would strengthen them and support them and, and give them courage to go on no matter what they face. And we pray for their persecutors as well, that they would turn uh, to you. We pray for our nation, Lord. We pray for our leaders. We pray that you would give them humble hearts before you and hearts that would truly seek wisdom from you in governing our land, that uh, the work of God might go forth unhindered. So we pray for that as well. We're mindful of those with special needs. I think of the Knowles family that Jeff mentioned. We pray God for healing and for strengthening and encouragement for them as well. We pray also for those listed in our bulletin for uh, Stan and Debbie, Rebecca and her family, for Benny, for Jim, for Bar Bob Bartoski, for Kay, Regina, Dwayne, Alice, and all others. We lift them up in our hearts and minds. Perhaps there are unspoken requests on our hearts today too, Lord, and we, in the quietness of our hearts, lift those to you. We pray that you would work for your glory and for the good of the precious souls that we pray for. Thank you for this beautiful season of the year, harvest time. Thank you for how you bless this area, particularly with rains and abundant crop. Thank you for your goodness in that regard. And keep uh, those that are involved in the harvest safe and well. And uh, so we commit that to you too. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this congregation. And each one represented here, those that aren't able to be with us today as well. Help us to be faithful as ambassadors for Christ as we live out our lives. We thank you for what you've done in our lives and help us to share that with others. So thank you for hearing all of our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll worship the Lord then by bringing him our tithes and offerings.
shelter and family and friends. We have so many blessings to thank you for. And above all, we want to thank you for providing salvation, forgiveness of sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray that these gifts that we're able to bring to you because of your blessing to us, that you would use them for your glory and honor and for the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll remain standing as we sing together number 129 in the gold hymnal, When We See Christ.
Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you would open our hearts, our ears, our minds uh, to receive from you, from the very word of God. Pray that you're, you would speak to us by the power of the Holy Spirit and the instruction of the Holy Spirit and accomplish your work and your will in every one of our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our subject today in this last Beatitude, Matthew 5, 10 through 12, is the subject of persecution. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. It's kind of like all the rest of the Beatitudes that we've looked at. We've said from time to time they're just the opposite of what we might expect. They're the opposite, certainly, of the values of the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit who wants to be poor. Blessed are those who mourn who wants to mourn. Blessed are the gentle. The values of Jesus, the things that make for divine happiness and blessedness, are the opposite of the values of the world. That's certainly true of this last one. Uh, blessed are the persecuted. Who wants to be persecuted? Uh, nobody wants to be persecuted. But Jesus says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are those who had all kinds of evil spoken against them because of me, because of Jesus, because of their relationship with Jesus. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is in heaven is great. And so we'll look at this uh, subject, this beatitude, if you will, about blessed are the persecuted. And I, I want to begin by just saying two real simple statements. Persecution is real, and persecution is to be expected. Uh, we're blessed to be born in the place where we were born, to live in the time in which we live. We have known very little persecution. Maybe I should just speak for myself, but I want to bring in an amen, you know. Have you known much persecution because... You're a Christian because of a stand that you've taken. Uh, not not very common in America and in this area and in our lives and in this period of history. But persecution is real. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a story. Of, we get a magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, the voice of the martyrs. It's the voice of those who live around the world who are persecuted for their faith. I was reading about where persecution is the strongest, the worst offender of Christian persecution is North Korea. And it's literally, it says, a death sentence to be a Christian in North Korea. If you're found out, if you are a, a Christian, it's a virtual death sentence. And there's a list of the most persecuted countries, and among them, surprisingly, is Mexico, our border to the south. In that magazine, The Voice of the Martyrs, it says this, the persecution of Christians in rural Mexico is severe, widespread, and persistent. Rural Mexican Christians face fierce opposition from varied sources, and their stories remain largely untold, not only among Christians in other nations, but also among most Mexican Christians, who are shocked to learn that other followers of Christ in their nation suffer violence and are driven from their homes. And there's a short story in the back of the magazine, and I'd like to read that just so you get a little flavor of what it's like to live where you are not free to come to know Jesus and follow Jesus with your whole heart. After Juan and his wife Josefina placed their faith in Christ in 2015, they stopped drinking and participating in their villages' pagan religious festivals. When leaders of the southern Mexican village realized a few years later what had caused the couple's change in behavior, they gave Juan an ultimatum, return to the traditional religion of the village or lose your house, your land, and your belongings. We decided to follow God, Juan said. I accepted Christ. I couldn't leave him. Is my land greater than God? Isn't he the owner of my life? The village leaders took all of the family's possessions, banned them from the village, and removed their names from the village's official list of residents, effectively revoking their Mexican citizenship. At the time, the couple had three children with a fourth child on the way. Juan also spent time in jail. It became a crime to accept the Lord, he said. While Juan was in jail, villagers ran his children out of town, and they got lost in the mountains for a day. After the family reunited, they spent months living outdoors under a tarp. 
The family situation eventually came to the attention of Ruth and Aurelio. And in the magazine, there's an article about them and their Christian ministry to those who are persecuted. Uh, Ruth and Aurelio, who invited the homeless Christians to stay in one of their temporary shelters, which they call Houses of Refuge. Ruth and Aurelio also provided the family with food, work, and schooling for their children, among other basic needs. And they encouraged their spiritual growth through regular Bible studies. We really are in good hands, Juan said. We thanked God from the beginning. While staying in the temporary shelter, the family received tangible help to rebuild their lives, grow in their faith, and recover from the persecution they suffered. Juan and his family now have their own home, land, and means of transportation, and their legal documentation of citizenship has been restored. Perhaps most important, they have grown in faith. I was a man of little faith, Juan said, but thanks to the Lord, his word is coming alive. I've seen many things after I left here, that God is real, and God is true, and God is faithful. Uh, every month when I read that magazine, and I can see what people are going through around the world, I also see statistics of things in the world. Uh, things like this, there are 13 people killed for their faith every day on average around the world. Just think about that for a minute as we sit here in peace and you know, on a beautiful day in the middle of a wonderful country. 13 people are killed on average every day somewhere in the world for their faith in Christ. 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked and or destroyed every day. 12 buildings, 12 churches every day. 12 people are unjustly arrested, detained, and in prison. And so persecution is real in the world. And persecution is also uh, to be expected. Uh, it's not something that's unusual according to what Jesus has to say here. And uh, the Apostle Paul was an expert on that as well. He was in prison many times. His life was in danger many times because of his preaching and because of his Christian faith. Paul wrote these words in 2 Timothy 3.12. He said, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So I, I just open with those two statements. Persecution is real, and persecu persecution is to be expected. When I read that verse that Paul wrote there about all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, sometimes that's a real challenge to me to think, why have I not faced much persecution in my life? Is it partly because I've not been as bold or as outspoken or taken a stand as much as I should before the world and before people? I just share that with you today. Think about that in your own life. There's a little persecution for Christians where we live, but maybe there would be more if we were bolder, if we were more outspoken, if we took a stronger stand for moral issues, for biblical issues, and so on. Just think about that. But uh, persecution is real, and persecution is to be expected. So two, two things I want us to kind of apply today. Uh, first one is pray for the persecuted church. Dear brothers and sisters are being persecuted right now as we meet to worship in absolute freedom. People will die today because of their faith in Christ. Church buildings, Christian buildings will be destroyed today because they're Christian churches and Christian buildings. So pray, pray for the persecuted church. We are called upon to do that. And uh, pray that they would be strengthened and encouraged. And uh, pray for their persecutors as well, that they would come to Christ. A second thing, not only pray for the persecuted church that comes out of these verses, but also listen to Jesus. Listen to what Jesus has to say about persecution from these three verses in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. And uh, First thing that I would share from these verses is this, what we want to learn from Jesus today. Uh, be persecuted for the right thing. If someday persecution does come to our country and to our lives, and some would say it already has in some, some ways, but make sure that you're persecuted for the right thing. Notice what it says here in verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Uh, if you commit a crime and you're in prison, you can't say, why well, being persecuted? You're, you're receiving justice. And that's why we're going to read in a minute from 1 Peter where it says, make sure that you suffer for the Lord, that you're suffering for the right reasons, not because you're a thief or because you're a murderer or you have reason, justice, but be persecuted for the right reason. And it really speaks to just living the Christian life. 
Live for Jesus. Trust Jesus as your Savior. And then live for Jesus. Obey His Word. And, and do that no matter what the cost. Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For the sake of righteousness. Being right with God. Living right with God. Be persecuted for the right reason. Also, in verse 11, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He said, because of me. This is Jesus talking. It's because of your relationship with Jesus. Because you trust in Him. Because you've committed your life to Him and you will obey Him and follow Him no matter what the world says. No matter what man's laws even say. There's one reason not to follow man's laws. And that's if it violates God's laws. And so because of following Jesus, Jesus said you may be persecuted. Those are the right reasons to be persecuted. Because of righteousness sake, Or because of your following Jesus. And so this is a message to us. Though we may not feel we're being persecuted, it's a call to live for Christ. To live an uncompromising life of witness and service for Jesus Christ. No matter what anybody else says. And no matter what the cost might be. I want to look at that as we think about that theme, being persecuted for the right thing. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, and we'll also read a few verses from verse 4. They really apply to what Jesus uh, was saying here in, in Matthew chapter 5. First of all, from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. Live for Jesus. Live an uncompromised, committed life for Jesus, following Him, serving Him, obeying, speaking up for Him in this world, no matter what the cost. Suffer if you must, for doing what's right, never for what's wrong. The next chapter there in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 12, says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome member. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So, live for Jesus. Uh, that's spoken to those who live in India or China or North Korea or, or wherever. Live for Jesus, no matter what the cost. But it's true for us, too. Maybe we don't face persecution. But live for Jesus. And, and, and live for Him with all your heart. And follow Him, obey Him, serve Him. Boldly tell of His love and of His gospel. If you're going to be persecuted, be persecuted for the right thing. Live the Christian life. Suffer for righteousness and for Jesus' sake, not for anything else. A second thing that I see in these verses is that we should also have the right attitude or the right spirit when we are persecuted. Be easy to give up. It'd be easy to get angry. It'd be easy to want revenge if we suffer for the sake of Christ. Here's what the Word of God would tell us regarding the right spirit or the right attitude we should have if indeed we are persecuted for our faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Jesus says later on in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, in the midst isn't this message about uh, blessed are the persecuted, there's a message to us, live the Christian life, no matter the cost. And then also, as it says here in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. We may not face overt persecution because of our faith in Christ, but we have people we have a hard time getting along with. We have people that we might even consider 
enemies or people we have a hard time with. But Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. God help us to have the right attitude and spirit, not only in the face of persecution, but just daily in the Christian life, in some of the trials that we face, in some of the difficulties with people. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And so the message to us, live for Christ. And live with the right spirit and the right attitude. The spirit of Christ, the love of Christ, the grace of Christ as we interact with people. Even those who might make fun of us or slander us or speak evil against us, as Jesus said in our text. And then a third thing that I want to share from these verses that's really important, it's right here in the text so clearly, it is why does Jesus say blessed? Now, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Why are we blessed? There are several things. The first one is right there in verse 10. Blessed are those who've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why are persecuted, pe persecuted people blessed? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing greater. There's no greater blessing than to be a part of the eternal kingdom of heaven. The eternal, unshakable kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world with all of its injustice, with all of its persecution around the world and so on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn. It's going to be gone. But the kingdom of heaven lasts forever. To be a believer in Jesus Christ, to have the assurance of salvation, to know that you're forgiven, to know that you have peace with God, to know that you have a home in heaven, that you're a part of the kingdom of heaven, nothing like it. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of this world is passing away. But we are part of the kingdom of heaven, the eternal, unshakable kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So why does Jesus say, blessed are the persecuted? How can he say that? Well, because those who are persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If they're persecuted for righteousness. Another verse here, verse 12 says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. As we live for Christ and trust Christ, we have a heavenly reward awaiting us. Ours is the kingdom of heaven. Our reward in heaven is great. No wonder Jesus says, blessed are the persecuted. Do you realize how blessed we are today? Think of all of the Beatitudes we've looked at over these weeks. Blessed, blessed, blessed. We are blessed if we are trusting in Christ and we are safe in his arms. Nothing in this life, not even persecution as far as death, stoning, being burned at the stake, as many have been through the ages. It's all irrelevant compared to being a part of God's eternal kingdom and having a reward that's great in heaven. Another reason that we might note that Jesus says, blessed are the persecuted, is because of, because of what it says in verse 12 also, where it says, in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're in good company. If you're persecuted for your faith in Christ, we're in good company. The prophets of God who took a stand for God, spoke for God, trusted in God, they've always been persecuted. We join uh, a holy band. We are a good company if we are persecuted for our faith in Christ. And uh, it's, it's also a sign that, that God's seal of approval is on us. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, was a verse that came to my mind as I was thinking of this uh, subject today. Acts chapter 5. Verse 41, the early church proclaimed Christ boldly, spent time in prison. And here's what that early church said in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. So they went on from their way, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. The council that's being talked about, there was a group of people that said, Stop preaching Christ. Stop healing people in Christ's name. And uh you don't, you're going to be thrown in jail. And they were. And they were greatly persecuted. And it says they went on their way rejoicing that they had been, been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Blessed are those who are persecuted because it shows that God has considered us worthy to suffer for his name's sake. And so there are many reasons that we are blessed, even if persecuted. We have the kingdom of heaven. Our reward in heaven is great. We're in good company. God considers us worthy to suffer for him. And so, blessed are the persecuted. And the last word I want to share is the beginning there, verse 12. It says, 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. A good, a good word to those who are receiving these Beatitudes, and a good word to us today. Rejoice and be glad. Who knows what the future holds for us? I know there are pastors in Canada who have been in prison simply for reading the Bible because they read passages that weren't politically correct. And there are a number of pastors in Canada who have been in prison. If some have been in prison during COVID because of stances they took one way or the other. I'm not getting into that whole article. But people who didn't agree with what the government said, and they were, they were sent to prison. Rejoice and be glad. Persecution may come to us in our lifetime. We don't know that. But the scripture says, rejoice and be glad. We have much to rejoice in. No matter how difficult life might get, what the circumstances might be, even if persecution to the ultimate comes, rejoice and be glad. Jesus said to those who had and were experiencing persecution. And what he's saying is, live for Jesus, uncompromising with your whole heart. Trust in Jesus. Follow Jesus. No matter what comes, it will be worth it all. We sang that, didn't we? It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. So live for Jesus. Be bold for Jesus. Rejoice and be glad. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this last of the Beatitudes that we've looked at. We thank you for the instructive words of Jesus and the very encouraging words of Jesus. We pray together today, Lord, for those who are experiencing persecution. There are thousands upon thousands of Christians who are in prison. Many who have lost their lives, Lord, too, in, in recent years and throughout history, simply because of their faith in Christ and their stand for Christ and unwillingness to compromise. We pray, God, for those that are enduring that today, that you would comfort them and strengthen them and help them to stand strong. We pray, God, for their persecutors, that they would turn their lives over to you. We pray for us, too, that we would be uncompromising, Lord. We are blessed with easy lives in, in many ways, we might say, but help us to be bold to live for Christ, too, and not to compromise in any way, and help us to realize that we are blessed <clears throat> no matter what. No matter what comes our way, trials, difficulties of life, or even persecution somewhere down the road, we are blessed. Help us to always rejoice and be glad and to face whatever we face in life with the right spirit, the right attitude of prayer and love for all around us. So we thank you for your word. Help us to take it and apply it to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We'll sing together. Thank you for communion this morning. Number 231, the gold hymn. We'll take the name of Jesus with you. Number 231. <laughs>
sacrifice for us and for our salvation. Uh, we want to come to communion, having examined our hearts and the right, the right heart and the right spirit. Dear and beloved, as we purpose to come to this Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature, that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God. And for our deliverance, he suffered death and all that we through our sins deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he instituted the holy sacrament of his supper in which he feeds us with his body and gives us the drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ, and Christ in him, and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death, and how he was delivered for our sins, and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts we should take up our cross and follow him, and according to his commandment, love one another, even as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. Let's confess our sin again in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had eaten and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, whose body and blood you now receive, and whereby you made full satisfaction for all of your sins, may he strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen. Thanks be to God. 